Today I want to look at the history of a million square foot building built in 1851. And this video, I really just want to focus on the narrative. You don't even have to watch the video. If we were just relying on photos, nothing else, to piece our narrative together, we might come up with different conclusions. But what I am basing my proof of this ridiculous history on is not the pictures, but rather the ridiculous narrative. So ridiculous, in fact, that it seems as if the writers had a good time writing it. And we'll explore that in this video. And again, forget about the pictures. In this particular video, as beautiful as they are, let's just focus on the plausibility of this said narrative. Welcome. And here I just wanted to look at the Crystal Palace. Kind of a world's fair, but not. This is to house the Great Exhibition of 1851. The exhibition was held for six months in this one million square foot building designed by a Joseph Paxton. After the exhibition, the palace was relocated to an area of South London. It was rebuilt in an affluent suburb. It stood there from June of 1854 until its destruction by fire in November of 1936. And it's mind-blowing enough to imagine building this, knowing very well you're only going to use it for six months. A temporary structure, one of the finest temporary structures I've ever seen. Today, many traveling circuses, art shows, and other such events settle on large tents. Even the Denver airport, looking like some temporary tents to me. Really ugly. But this, in 1850, in the fragile and fine year of 1850, does this look temporary to anybody? Does this look like it can be moved? Who would dream of such a thing? Again, ridiculous to think of building this, but moving it? And we're told they rebuilt it in two years. And it seems we have a variety of actual pictures and renderings. Here we have the conception. And this, of course, was a contest. It had to conform to several key specifications. The buildings had to be temporary, simple, as cheap as possible, and economical to build within the short time remaining before the exhibition opening, which had already been scheduled for May 1st, 1851. So, if I'm getting this correctly, it took a year to build, and here we are told of construction, using pulleys and ropes to hoist columns and girders into place. And just a real success story. Everything going smoothly, building this building in one year, even a full-size elm tree growing in the park was enclosed within the central exhibition hall. So they're telling us this tree was already here, and they just built the Crystal Palace around the tree. And this is their explanation for telling us why there's a full-size tree in this temporary building. A very creative narrative. And it opened in 1851, again without a hiccup. Only a year ago they were planning, and now it's done, and in fact it is the first of the World's Fair exhibitions. There were some 100,000 objects displayed along more than 10 miles 
And the great exhibition was limited to six months. After which, they had to decide on the future location of the palace building. The reconstruction of the building began on Sydenham Hill in 1852. Look how quickly they move. Already rebuilding it again a year later. And here it is after its move in 1854. There we go. They moved everything, including the fountains and the same towers. They really did a great job of making it seem identical. Absolute skills in the 1850s. Anything is possible. Moving buildings with horse, buggy, and ropes? No problem. Within two years, the palace buildings were completely rebuilt. In 1854, Queen Victoria again performed an opening ceremony in the presence of 40,000 guests. Very important, there were 40,000 witnesses, nothing less. However, several localities claimed to be the area which the building was moved. And in short, in our present time, they're just not sure where it used to be. However, there are remains of the upper terrace. Here's a picture in 1993. And look carefully at this picture. And we all have these. Except these days, they're simply parks. Parks with random structures. We've all been to them. And you ask yourself, what is this random set of stairs it might be? Or a pavilion? And to imagine that this ridiculous story that they tell us was true? Such a story only serves to make humanity look stupid. In one breath, we're told they have the abilities to construct and move structures like this. And in the next breath, we're told we just can't keep our buildings from burning. We don't even know what to do with these buildings. After the war, the site was used for a number of purposes. Between 1927 and 1972, the Crystal Palace Motor Racing Circuit was located in the park. So they're turning it into a racetrack. During the First World War, it was used as a naval training establishment. Until finally in 1936, Buckland was walking his dog near the Crystal Palace with his daughter, Crystal. Named after the palace, when they noticed a red glow within, they called the fire department. Over 400 firemen arrived, yet they were unable to extinguish it. Within hours, the palace was destroyed. Winston Churchill was said to have attended to watch the blaze, and he was quoted as saying, This is the end of an age. And I think this is the only bit of truth in this entire narrative. A pretty wild story for explaining away the impossible. It amazes me how connected we all are, and we supposedly know so much, and yet I think we know nothing. Of course, we know nothing of our past, just fragmented bits interlaced with piles of lies. And as I've mentioned before, I've been pretty fortunate through this false pandemic. My small old-fashioned country town is weary of change, which usually makes it a pretty miserable place. But it's been pretty beneficial during this whole situation. There are stubborn people not ready to let city folks tell them what to do. For the most part, I've been able to remain face diaper free this whole time. And as of today, I would say 95% of the people are not wearing the diaper. But as I expected, although not so soon, they're ramping up the fear once again. Even in my state, I saw a headliner warning of this new threat. And I think by now, the people see right through it. 
By now, after all this time, no significant number of people in any part of this realm succumbing to anything worse than a simple flu. The numbers just aren't there, and yet they keep cracking down on people's basic rights. And you'll hear all kinds of news on this new scare, but what you won't hear is that people are taking to the streets everywhere. And here's a little look at Paris. And what's interesting is the reporting that's going on. Here we're looking at NBC News. And this sign says, you are nothing. And he is nothing. How dare one person cause so much disharmony in a nation. And even worse, when it's a supposed leader. And the people are pissed. And what I see here is the big threat has nothing to do with health. And the first time I saw Star Wars, I thought how silly these stormtroopers are. No military would ever wear such goofy hats. And yet I think we've been there for some years now. The stormtrooper in the streets is an accepted part of our modern reality, sadly. And am I scared of a microscopic threat, or am I more threatened by blind servants of policy, trained to act without a conscience, putting policy before common sense and humanity? And here we are in Hamburg, Germany, and these are some kind of super cannons meant to blast the people with water. And again, the media is just calling these people extreme party activists and acting as if all of these riots are separate issues. We have riots in South Africa, and these are being blamed on the imprisonment of their state leader. And everything is being blamed on something else. And even when these reporters are talking about the situation, such as in South Africa. They were saying how hard the country was hit by the pandemic, but not health-wise, financially, and how this fueled the people's need to riot. And yet that is a truth. The financial ramifications of all of this have been significantly worse than the health aspect. Again, the health aspect has been no worse than a bad flu. And when you consider it replaced the flu, and those numbers just plunged, it was pretty much a wash. And again, this writing, I think, has a lot more to do with policy. And here we are in Turin, Italy. And hopefully nobody loots the shroud. And has anybody seen any of this? And here in London, how much freedom can you take from people? Another five days. What is another five days? Another five days to somebody who's hungry and out of work, told to stay at home and just be patient. And here in Turkey, they tell us hundreds of people were arrested for holding a workers' rally as the country battles a surge in blah blah infections. So, workers' rights rally. These people just want to work and the solution is to arrest them. One way or another, you're staying in. Really reminding me of being grounded as a child. As a child, I used to slip out the window. And it's a problem when you're in a city with overseers. Out in the country, even if a lockdown was imposed, one may hardly notice it. But things are always pleasantly boring in the country. This is the other side of the coin. And if I lived in any such city, I would have gotten out a year ago, or when all this started. This is beyond acceptable. And so this is what we have. Do what we say, or be deposited in a cell. A complete loss of free will. A violation of God's law. This is what we're dealing with. And I believe life will always throw problems at us, as individuals, and as a people, as nations. This is part of the matrix, part of this program similar to the book of Job, in which God 
and an unsavory character who seems to be his buddy are having an interesting chat and seeming to somewhat make a bet on whether or not this man will break and everything is taken from this man his family, his home, his friends, his health and it seems miserable in reading the story you feel yourself as if you would break in this man's position, Job. And yet, this man does not break. In the face of these great hardships, he doesn't break and resort to harsh thinking or vengeance. And more importantly, he doesn't waver from his faith in God. And how does the story end? Everything is returned to him tenfold. He gets a better wife, better lands, livestock, and in short, his life was a pile of shit. Sure, it seemed good and full on the outside, but it really wasn't. It was full of impure elements that metaphorically needed to burn for the good to rise from the ashes. And I think taking an optimistic view, we are seeing the same thing taking place everywhere right now. From the research that we do, it hasn't been good for 150 years, at least. We have been living in a complete lie. Our whole history fabricated our sciences and idea of where we are and what this realm really is. This is all so new. And what did we think would happen? Did we not expect some kind of change? Surely millions of people know the truth about our history, lies about space, and absolute corruption within the faction of our overseers. And I always think, what can we do? What should we do? And perhaps we don't need to do anything. Perhaps something is already set in motion. And now you find a nice, comfortable seat somewhere safe and enjoy the show. And there's a passage in the I Ching that talks about the importance of clinging to the possibility of a good outcome. And this passage comes usually in an instance where there's great adversity and things feel impossible and hopeless. And yet it tells you to cling to the anticipation of a good outcome and to cling the way that fire clings to wood. And what is meant by this is to cling to the source, because sometimes that's all you can do. And perhaps it is always, very simply, the most important thing to do. Similar again to Job, I think a story about somebody who mastered the game. Rather than fight, he chose acceptance and allowed the dream to run its course. And this is very similar to our old world where they want to tell us that everybody was separate, when in actuality, we are united. And all these protesters throughout the realm are actually one voice. Well, I think that's all I have to say today. I thank you for joining me, and do have a blessed day. Please like, comment, and subscribe.